right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to this Federalist Society event. Today, we're fortunate to welcome Ms. Erin Hawley and Professor Jennifer No to discuss Kaiser and Gundy and the future of administrative law. Um, and you may have noticed we're recording this event, but only the speaker will appear in the re recording. So uh, please don't let that stop you from participating today. Erin Hawley is legal counsel at Alliance Defending Freedom and a senior legal fellow at the Independent Women's Law Center. She received her BA from Texas A&M and JD from Yale Law School, where she served as a Coker Fellow and member of the Yale Law Journal. After graduation, Ms. Hawley clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and Chief Justice John Roberts on the U.S. Supreme Court. She previously practiced appellate law in Washington, D.C. and was an associate professor of law at the University of Missouri. Jennifer Noe is a professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School. She received her BA and JD from Yale and an MPhil in politics from Oxford University as a Marshall Scholar. After law school, Professor Noe clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit and Justice Stephen Breyer on the U.S. Supreme Court. She previously served as a public law fellow at the law school and worked in the Office of Admin... Uh, mm -hmm. OIRA is what I always call it, but Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Professor Noe's main research interests are admin law, uh, regulatory policy, and constitutional separation of powers. So with that, we'll turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Hawley. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm uh, looking forward to this, this discussion uh, with Professor No. Um, and for all of you out there, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are interested uh, in administrative law, um, but I'm certain that we would agree that it's one of the most important, um, and uh, I think probably in both of our views, fascinating uh, areas of the law. So we're excited to talk to you about that today, uh, and in particular, how those uh, doctrines that are sort of fundamental to administrative law may or may not change uh, in the near future. Uh, so I wanted to start just with a, a sort of a, a 30,000 foot view of administrative law. And as we all know from, you know, our junior high civics class, uh, we were taught, uh, you know, that Congress makes the law, uh, the president uh, executes or enforces the law, uh, and the judiciary interprets the law. But that is at least uh, an incomplete story, uh, if not being uh, somewhat inaccurate. And if we look at the federal regulations uh, in calendar years 2015 and 16, uh, the administrative agencies regulated 12 times uh, as much as Congress. Uh, so they, they filled about 60,000 pages of the CFR, uh, and Congress, meanwhile, filled about 7,000 pages uh, of the statutes at large. And I think that uh, no one would uh, disagree uh, with the idea that we have administrative agencies today uh, who are making rules uh, with the force and effect of law, uh, and that these rules have very real world consequences uh, on individuals and on businesses. If we think of just one example uh, from recent case law, uh, we can look at the Little Sisters of the Poor. And the Little Sisters of the Poor, as many of you from, are familiar with, uh, is the Catholic order of nuns uh, that serve the elderly, poor, and dying. Uh, they basically provide hospice care uh, to those who cannot afford it. Um, and this seems like a group that really wouldn't get crossways with the administrative state uh, or the administration, um, but they managed to do so because of their religious beliefs uh, about um, abortion uh, and about uh, different contraceptive measures. And where the administrative uh, state comes uh, into all of this uh, is it was HHS, actually a sub sub agency of HHS, uh, that defined the term, the statutory term preventive care. Uh, so in the Affordable Care Act, uh, Congress enacted, I think, a 900 page statute, so massive regulation, uh, but they left uh, many holes in that statute uh, to agencies to fill in. Uh, one of those holes was the definition of women's preventive care. Um, in filling out this definition, HHS included, uh, as required in all insurance plans, all FDA approved contraceptives. And that put the Little Sisters uh, on a collision course uh, with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, in addition to defining preventive care, uh, they also defined uh, sort of the religious exemption uh, to the Affordable Care Act and did so narrowly. So in this case, you see uh, two uh, very uh, sort of um, important regulations uh, being made uh, at the administrative level uh, rather than uh, being left uh, to Congress. So that's just one example of what the administrative uh, uh, agencies uh, do day in uh, and day out. 
And if we think about sort of our constitutional structure, uh, this is not news uh, to any of you, uh, but Article I uh, states uh, that Congress shall have the power to make law. Article II gives the power to execute uh, that law uh, to the executive or president. Uh, and Article III gives the judicial power uh, to the judiciary. Uh, each of these clauses has a vesting clause uh, that's typically thought to be self-executing uh, and also exclusive. And this sort of builds upon Madison's idea uh, that separation of powers was liberty enhancing. In Madison and many of the framers' views, uh, it required sort of a lot of work to curtail individual liberty. And that meant you had to have Congress enact a law, you had to have uh, the president choose to enforce that law, and you had to have the judiciary interpret that law in a way adverse to an individual before that individual could be sanctioned. Uh, so you've got all of the branches sort of acting in concert uh, before the power of government could be applied uh, to an individual or to a business. And uh, now we see uh, that that sort of state of play uh, is not what we see today in the administrative agencies. Those agencies often combine all three of the government functions uh, within a single roof. Uh, they often make uh, agency regulations that have the force and effect of law. Uh, they have sort of administrative uh, panels that review those regulations, um, and they also enforce them against both individuals and businesses. And we don't have a lot of time today, but I wanted to talk in particular about two administrative law doctrines that get at the heart of two of these sort of constitutional tensions. Um, one constitutional tension being the tension between Article I, vesting the legislative power in Congress, and the fact that agencies make an awful lot of regulation, and the, the other uh, sort of tension uh, being the fact that the Constitution gives the judicial power uh, to the judicial branch, to the Supreme Court, and to such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time establish. Uh, and yet, uh, we see administrative agencies uh, that are giving wide deference in the way they interpret statutes and regulations. So that first, first sort of bucket of sort of constitutional tension is a doctrine known as the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, and this non-delegation doctrine basically just stays, uh, states uh, that Congress should not be allowed to delegate away its Article I powers. Uh, in a famous case, uh, you probably read about in your first year constitutional law class, the sick, the sick chicken case uh, or the Schechter poultry case, uh, the Supreme Court uh, struck down uh, the, the NIRA, uh, that statute, um, under the non-delegation doctrine. And this was, it was uh, sort of a, a very broad statute. And what it did was it gave the power to uh, the president to approve codes of fair competition. Uh, and in that instance, the president had approved a code of fair, fair competition Petition, excuse me, uh, for butchers operating in New York. Um, well, kosher butchers had a problem complying with some of these different regulations that were contained uh, in the Code of Fair Competition. So they sued to challenge uh, the statute and, and did so on, on non-delegation doctrine. And they said that the Constitution doesn't allow Congress to, to delegate away its power uh, to create codes of fair conduct. Uh, the Supreme Court agreed. Um, they talked about the separation of powers principles. Uh, in a memorable concurrence, Justice Cardozo uh, sort of described this situation as delegation running riot. Uh, so, so a catchy phrase here uh, in which the Supreme Court basically said, uh, no, Congress, there are some limits. Uh, you cannot delegate away all of your Article I power uh, to the president uh, or to sort of administrative uh, agencies, uh, these, these different industry groups. Now, fast forward, um, and the Supreme Court has all but abandoned uh, the non-delegation doctrine. Currently, all the court requires is an intelligible principle. It has sanctioned uh, statutes uh, that allow uh, the price administrator to set fair and reasonable prices. Um, it, it allows uh, uh, agencies to regulate in the public interest. So really broad sort of delegations that would seem to violate Schechter Poultry, uh, but which the court uh, has upheld under the intelligible principle uh, sort of standard. And we'll talk, there is some, some uh, shaking up uh, of things in a recent case, so we'll talk about that. Um, and that case is called Gundy versus United States, or United States versus Gundy. Um, and this arises out of a 2006 statute. Um, and this was the Sex Offender Registration and something Act, SORNA, uh, of 2006. Uh, and what happened in 2006 was Congress sort of uh, fixed uh, the sex offender registry and made it uh, uh, the, the same all over the country. There was a patchwork of regulations and that allowed about 20% of sex offenders uh, to be able to escape regulation. Uh, so Congress uh, sort of federalized uh, this area of the law, set up federal standards uh, to register. Um, and in doing so, I want to read uh, this language because it's really interesting. 
Uh, so for uh, those uh, that violated the act um, uh, after uh, 2006, uh, they prescribed uh, penalties uh, for failing to register. So pretty clear for uh, sex offenders convicted after 2006. But for those that were convicted before 2006, uh, what the statute says is that the, the attorney general shall have the authority to specify the applicability of the requirements of the subchapter. So to specify the applicability of the statute uh, to pre-act offenders and to prescribe the rules for registration for pre-act offenders. So this seems to give to the attorney general, to the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, the ability both to say if uh, this SORNA legislation applies to pre-act offenders and also how to apply it to pre-act offenders. So an awful lot of discretion. Um, and this Supreme Court granted cert, um, and it was a shocking cert grant uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being that 11 courts of appeals had held that the non-delegation doctrine did not in fact uh, have any applicability to the statute. It, it, the non-delegation doctrine was basically considered dead. Um, and uh, so the statute even giving such broad authority uh, to the attorney general uh, was not problematic under the doctrine. And then secondly, that sort of uh, relatedly, is that uh, the question presented actually asked the Supreme Court to reconsider the non-delegation doctrine um, and sort of wh whether it was alive, well and alive. Uh, so we get this surprising cert grant and everyone's sort of wondering, you know, what, what's going on? Uh, is there some interest on the Supreme Court in reviving uh, the non-delegation doctrine? And we see from the holdings, uh, the different opinions in that case, I should say, that there is some interest. Um, and I'd love to hear Professor uh, Noe's uh, thoughts on this as well. Uh, but you've got three different opinions um, in a plurality opinion, uh, the so-called liberal justices uh, sort of look at the statute and they say, you know, this court has interpreted it before. It doesn't actually give all this broad authority uh, to uh, the attorney general. Rather, the statute requires uh, that the attorney general uh, implement uh, the 2006 law to pre-act offenders as soon as feasible. So the, the so-called liberal justices basically redline the statute and say, you know, if we interpret it this way, uh, then there's no non-delegation doctrine. Uh, Justice Alito uh, has kind of a strange concurrence. Uh, and basically he says, uh, you know, Congress uh, has the legislative power. Uh, it's clearly been delegated here to the attorney general. That's problematic. Uh, but our case law uh, clearly uh, sanctions this sort of delegation. So unless there's a majority of the court willing to reconsider it, this case doesn't differ from others in which we have upheld really broad delegations. So he signals that interest uh, in revisiting the non-delegation doctrine, considering its applicability, but wants to wait for a majority. And then there's a three justice dissent uh, authored by Justice Gorsuch, joined by Justice Thomas uh, and the Chief Justice. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh uh, did not participate in oral argument, uh, so did not participate in the vote. Um, but we've got uh, Gorsuch, uh, Alito, and the Chief Justice uh, writing to say that this statute violates the non-delegation doctrine. Um, and again, this is a huge break uh, with precedent, uh, or seemingly so, as Justice Alito hinted, uh, because the court is finding there is actually an enforceable limit on the amount of policymaking decision that Congress may delegate to an agency. And then one of the most interesting parts of that opinion, uh, Justice Gorsuch lays out you know, the constitutional case for requiring Congress uh, to actually make the law uh, and not to delegate it. Um, but then he goes on to say how he would reformulate the non-delegation doctrine. And what he says basically is that the court should ask whether Congress has reserved the policymaking authority uh, of uh, Congress, uh, uh, the decision-making for, for whatever substance of the law, if Congress has decided the policy questions and only left the fact finding uh, to the agency, that's okay. Uh, but if on the other hand, Congress has delegated policy making authority uh, to the agency, then that's problematic under the non-delegation doctrine in Justice Gorsuch's view. Um, of course, if we think back to the Little Sisters example, uh, we've got at least a couple of policy making uh, sort of decisions being made by the agency, HHS. Uh, the agency filled out sort of uh, what qualified as women's preventive care. They also filled out the religious liberty exemption. Uh, so, so it seems like that statute uh, would be problematic uh, under uh, the non-delegation doctrine. And really, I think you could, could look at a lot of statutes uh, and probably conclude that they vest a lot of policymaking authority uh, with agencies. So a question going forward uh, as to whether the court will actually give some teeth uh, to the non-delegation doctrine, or if instead they'll sort of align 
align more with Justice Kagan and, and say basically the realities of government today mean that we have to allow agencies to make these sorts of decisions. Uh, that's just how our government functions. It's the only way uh, it can function. Um, it looks like we have four justices um, that uh, would probably say the non-delegation is alive. Um, Justice Kavanaugh um, has been uh, has written a lot in terms of separation of powers. Uh, so it's likely, or at least potentially likely, um, he would be interested in reviving the doctrine. Justice Barrett really has not written much uh, on administrative law. She's talked about separation of powers. Um, so she may be interested um, in sort of thinking about these structural issues, uh, but we don't have many indicators uh, on that front. So that's the non-delegation doctrine and sort of one, one bucket of cases that we may see change uh, in the near uh, or at least medium term uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, the second bucket of cases deals with the constitutional tension uh, between the judicial branch and administrative agencies. And this is where the Chevron doctrine and its progeny uh, come in. Uh, so Chevron, of course, uh, is the doctrine, uh, a case written um, uh, that uh, I think, I'm forgetting who wrote the, the first opinion, uh, ours written by uh, Justice Scalia. But I think, I think Justice Scalia, uh, at least he was supportive uh, of the Chevron Doctrine. And what Chevron Doctrine uh, is, is it basically says that uh, the judiciary is not a, a policy creating branch. Uh, the judicial branch is not supposed to make policy. Uh, and thus, uh, when you are faced with an ambiguity in a regulation, then the judiciary should defer to the agency's interpretation uh, of that uh, statute. So the idea is that we don't want judiciary making policy. So the, the federal courts are going to defer to an agency's interpretation uh, of the congressional statute. Um, so, so there is some, some appeal to that. Um, and I think the one reason why Justice Scalia was supportive uh, of the Chevron doctrine is it really does uh, remove um, some policymaking authority from the federal courts. Uh, the problem, as others have pointed out, Justice uh, Thomas, uh, Justice uh, Kennedy, uh, the Chief Justice, um, is that um, it doesn't put that interpretive authority back with Congress. Um, it rather gives it to administrative agencies. Um, so in Chevron, uh, the idea is that if you have a hole in the statute, that it's more appropriate for the agency to fill in that hole because Congress delegated it to them uh, than it is for the Supreme Court to sort of make their best guess uh, as to what that statute uh, is supposed to mean. Uh, and then we have a lot of follow on cases uh, from Chevron. Uh, we've got our deference, uh, which gives the same deference to an agency's interpretation of its own regulation. Uh, we've got brand X um, in which the Supreme Court said uh, that even uh, if the Supreme Court says a statute means something, means X, that an agency can come back and say, no, actually the statute means Y. Um, so in that instance in particular, uh, you've got an example of uh, a seeming instance of the agency interpreting uh, federal law. So you, again, you've got this tension between what is the judicial power that's supposed to be vested in the Article III courts, uh, rather than sort of what is, is uh, uh, permissible uh, for an agency to do. And so we get a case um, a couple of terms ago, uh, an hour deference case. Um, and this case uh, was known as Kaiser versus Wilkie. Um, it was really an anticipated case. Um, it seemed like uh, Justice Kennedy in one of his very last opinions on the court uh, sort of made a plea to revisit the Chevron Doctrine. Uh, the Chief Justice uh, was on record uh, for being uh, sort of skeptical of the Chevron Doctrine and of agencies interpreting federal law. Uh, we've got Justice Thomas, uh, who's on record for being skeptical. Uh, the writings of Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh suggest that they might also be skeptical. So I think there was uh, some sort of consensus that the doctrine might really change uh, in our. And so what happens uh, in this case uh, is you've got a Vietnam War veteran, uh, Mr. Kaiser, who served in Operation, uh, Operation Harvest Moon, uh, and he had applied for disability benefits back in the 1980s. At that point, a psychiatrist had found that he did not suffer from PTSD. Well, he moved to reopen his case in 2006. A new, uh, excuse me, a new psychiatric evaluation found that he did have PTSD, um, but the court, uh, well, first the Veterans Administration uh, refused to award him back benefits based on its own interpretation of a regulation. Uh, the Federal Circuit ultimately agreed, uh, and they said that Mr. Kaiser was not entitled to past benefits, to retroactive benefits, because of the way the Veterans Administration interpreted its own rule. So here we have sort of delegation upon delegation. Uh, Congress enacts a statute, 
Uh, then you've got the administrative agencies interpreting that statute and then interpreting their own regulation. So it's that second level regulation here, the sub-regulation uh, that the uh, agency said applied uh, to bar Mr. Kaiser's uh, uh, reopening uh, or retroactive award uh, of benefits. Uh, so the court looks at this case uh, and we come out with a surprising uh, plurality opinion um, of the four more so known uh, to be liberal justices. So Justice Kagan writes for herself, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, Sotomayor, and she defends the our presumption. And she says that we've explained that our deference is rooted in a presumption about congressional intent, that Congress would generally want the agency and not the courts to fill in the gaps. So she gives sort of a full-throated defense uh, to our deference. But then she sort of lists a laundry list of things in which uh, the, our deference wouldn't apply. And one of those, interestingly, is that, that the uh, agency interpretation of its own regulation has to be reasonable. Uh, which sort of gets us back to, to ordinary review of agency regulations uh, without a lot of deference anyway. So, so at best, we've got sort of this, uh, as Justice Gorsuch has called it, a mummified version uh, or zombified version of our deference uh, that remains. Uh, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts has sort of a strange concurrence again. Uh, we had one from Justice Alito uh, in Gundy. Uh, in this case, Chief Justice Ry Roberts writes and basically upholds it, off, excuse me, on precedent. So he says, if you look at precedent, this is clearly okay. But, and this is super interesting, he goes on to say that this case should not uh, be interpreted to say anything about Chevron deference, uh, that maybe Chevron is different because it involves an agency's interpretation of a statute rather than an agency's interpretation of its own regulation. And then again, you've got the four dissenters, uh, you've got Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch, uh, Alito and Thomas uh, writing to say that our deference uh, should be overruled uh, because it gives too much interpretive power uh, to the agencies rather rather than uh, to uh, federal courts, which are vested with the judicial power. So again, these are two areas uh, in which we see uh, possible change on the Supreme Court. Uh, both would be sort of momentous changes in the areas of administrative law. Uh, the non-delegation doctrine has long been considered dead letter, uh, basically on the premise that, that we need agencies to do all of these sorts of things uh, because our government is so big. Um, but at least there seems to be some uh, sort of appetite among some justices to say no, uh, the constitution grants to Congress uh, the power to make law. Uh, they're in charge of policy making decisions and there are at least some boundaries uh, that the courts can police. And then the second area that we just talked about is the Chevron doctrine and the fact that it gives deference uh, in interpretation uh, to administrative agencies. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, when he was on the Tenth Circuit, sort of wrote uh, sort of uh, uh, in uh, colorful terms uh, on this and said, you know, it's emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, uh, quoting Chief Justice uh, Marshall. Uh, so he at least, I, I think, would be inclined to say that this sort of deference uh, to agencies uh, takes away from the Article Three power uh, of the federal courts. Um, and it is sure to be joined by at least a few other justices. So I would encourage all of you, uh, as you think about administrative law, uh, it's not just some arcane thing. Um, it actually uh, is alive and well. Uh, there's, there are questions that are alive and well in the federal courts. Um, and would love to hear uh, Professor No's uh, perspective now. Well, thanks so much, Erin. It is um, wonderful to have you have you um, at Chicago. Um, she and I have been um, I've been wanting to cross paths uh, for a long time, and I'm I'm glad to have the chance to do so now. Um, so I will, I'm going to keep my comments pretty brief because Erin um, uh, has to run off at um, at one, and so I want to leave plenty of time for for student discussion. Um, but just in response, so I want to first kind of emphasize some points of agreement, um, and then maybe talk about um, some points of not so much uh, disagreement, but maybe a reframing of some of the cases. Um, and third, maybe just end with some kind of ruminations on um, why it is that Congress um, is not making law these days and whether we can expect that um, to continue. So first on points of, dis of agreement, absolute agreement. I mean, I think change is coming. Um, just as um, Professor Holly um, told us in Gundy, indeed, there were four um, votes uh, suggesting that, um, well, so, so there was a legal so concurrence and certainly the, the dissent, but I also wanna emphasize that um, four justices in, in writings have um, talked about uh, their discomfort with um, Gundy. So we have um, Gorsuch, 
Thomas and Roberts in dissent, and then the Alito, the indeed the odd concurrence. But I think Alito um, was suggesting that look, SORNA is not going to be the statute where the court is going to to come out blazing with non delegation. Um, on non-delegation, um, indeed, um, a statute. It's it's just the optics of it are are um, not where the court wants to come out in terms of a sex offender registry statute. And so I, I very much believe, based on his other writings, that Alito indeed will um, look for a case where um, non-delegation can be revisited. And then Kavanaugh, in a separate writing later, when he comes on the bench, and it's a case called U.S. versus Paul. I mean, he actually has gone on, on record um, specifically with Gundy to say that he agrees with um, Gorsuch's concerns about the non-delegation doctrine. And then he has this interesting statement where he says, um, note that we currently have the major questions doctrine. Um, for those of you that have taken administrative law, you're familiar with this idea, but it's like the, the basic idea that um, when there is a major question uh, of economic or political significance, um, we saw versions of this in King versus Burwell and in many other cases, that um, the court will either um, only defer to the agency if Congress is more clear about its preferences. And absent that, um, Congress itself has to make the policy decisions in these major questions. And Kavanaugh in U.S. versus Paul says, look, what Gundy would do is basically not allow Congress to delegate major questions to agencies. Okay, And so um, this is all just to say we now have five justices um, who are very clearly in favor of revisiting um, the non-delegation doctrine. Um, but the theme that I want to emphasize more in kind of the reframing is that I actually think that um, in practice, even if that were to happen, that not much is going to change. That is to say, I think a lot of the hand-wringing about the death of the administrative state is really overblown. Um, and I think the main reason why I believe that is I think so many of these changes depend on how justices will approach the questions of interpretation that are necessary, both under the non-delegation doctrine, and then of course also in Chevron and in our with statutory interpretation and regulatory interpretation respectively. And so first take the non-delegation doctrine. Um, you know, even on Gorsuch's approach, right, which he says, look, you know, he, he would basically um, bless statutes as long as they allowed for um, executive fact finding, if they only allow for the executive to fill in the details, or otherwise to allow um, agencies to um, act in clearly non-legislative areas, such as like in foreign affairs, and that's, you know, under the president's prerogative under the Constitution. And um, note that even to make each of those determinations under the statute, judges and the justices will have to engage in some kind of statutory interpretation, right? So take, you know, even statutes like the public interest, right? Uh, the text is certainly very broad, okay? But once we think about exactly of, of importing all the tools of statutory construction, okay, it's possible that even a broad phrase like that can become very narrow. And indeed, that's already what courts are doing under the non-delegation doctrine. That is to say, um, non-delegation is really a canon of construction now. That is to say, um, judges and justices um, strain to kind of read the statute um, to give it some intelligible principle. And I think what Gorsuch's approach would still require is judges and justices to um, read the statute, and um, only when the statutory materials run out um, does this non-delegation doctrine arise. So that's to say that there is indeed going, would be a change in Gorsuch's approach, but I think the change, again, is limited by how much work justices will still have to do to interpret the statute. And the same goes for Chevron. Okay, so, you know, Chevron step one, of course, I think answers many of the criticisms of Chevron um, that it is an abdication of the um, either the constitutional um, exercise of the judicial power or the um, requirement under APA section 706 that it's the courts that make the law. And, you know, as many um, defenders of Chevron will say, um, step one still preserves that role for the courts. That is to say that the courts can still um, make excuse me, uh, say what the law is um, at that step. And there too, again, there is the continuing question of what are all the tools of statutory construction that are allowed under Chevron? And um, I think this is going to present um, an interesting tension for many of the justices 
that on the one hand, um, want judges to constrain agency discretion, that is um, exercise much more oversight. And to do so, they will have to read the statutes. But if they are only constrained to the text, um, that in effect will result in many more statutes being potentially being determined to be ambiguous. So in other words, I wonder, question mark, if we'll see more judges and justices, um, well, there'll be kind of a um, two kinds of statutory interpretation, right? Ordinary statutory interpretation where judges will continue to be textualist. And then in the domains of the administrative state, will judges you know, allow for legislative history, will allow for purpose um, and other tools of statutory interpretation to come in in a bid to exercise more oversight over the administrative state. And if not, then there is that they're, they're going to have to struggle to reconcile um, the tensions that's po that are posed by their own um, approaches to statutory interpretation and also their appetite to rein in the administrative state. Um, and then finally, I, I'll make the same observation about regulatory interpretation as well. And indeed, you know, um, as, as Professor Holly points out, I mean, like many of the, the justices in Keysore, um, you know, Roberts goes out of his way to emphasize the ways in which the majority's approach, that is to say, I, you know, I, I characterize that as kind of tamed our deference, right? Our um, uh, 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 fleshing out of ours domain. Um, it's really not that different in practice potentially with the Skidmore approach that um, that uh, the, the dissent seeks in, in Kisor. Um, and, um, you know, I think Gorsuch's um, dissent there too, um, you know, calls for a lot calls for judges to be much more um, independent, and so does Kagan's majority. And that's what Roberts emphasizes, I think, um, Kavanaugh's concurrence in um, Kisor also emphasizes um, the, that point of agreement. And so this is all just to say that the more tools of regulatory interpretation that are used um, by judges, um, either under Skidmore or um, under our sort of tamed, um, are still going to allow judges to um, exercise that power. And I'm just going to finally just observe that all of this is consistent with kind of pre-APA practice. In other words, the observation has been made that um, even if Chevron and our were formally, you know, overruled, that, you know, in practice, you know, for a long time, um, judges, you know, exercised a kind of um, Chevron deference. I mean, it's true that, you know, there's a Skidmore line of cases, um, but, you know, even in Skidmore, um, you know, some people understand that to be a form of deference. And so this is just to say that, you know, some people believe, um, I think rightly, that, you know, not much will change on the ground. Um, what will change, I think, um, is the you know, some, some judges frame it as the judicial mood uh, towards the administrative state. In other words, I think one way to understand all of these opinions is um, kind of warning signals, flares to the administrative state that, um, you know, the judicial mood is changing. And um, I think that um, that is supported until recently in, very, in, in other branches of government as well. Um, and as a result, um, one, I think Congress is more on notice that, uh, that to the extent possible, uh, they should be uh, writing statutes more narrowly, um, that um, the executive branch too should um, be on notice that um, you know, when it writes rules, it should write them with clarity and um, that there should be more skepticism about using interpretive rules and guidance documents as a way to um, make law. And I think the Trump administration's efforts to cabin that, um, I think have, um, will continue. I think there, that there will be still kind of remnants of that, even in the Biden administration, that is to say that there will be kind of a wariness, if you will, about um, feeding into the criticisms of the administrative state run amok. Um, lastly, I'll just say, look, you know, for all of the um, desires that the judici judiciary has um, and commentators, um, and I share many of these desires for Congress 
to make the law. I think, you know, in our time, in our modern times with all the political polarization, um, Congress is not um, shown itself to be the branch to be able to make law. And one question going forward is going to be the extent to which um, the, the extent to which, you know, this is going to continue. And as a result, you know, if these judicial doctrines are overruled, um, will we just be left with a place where um, Congress will not be able to draft narrower statutes and therefore uh, will just not pass laws at all? And I think to the some of the libertarians in the in the room, and you know, to to the small government types, this is great. This is terrific, and this is something that that should be celebrated. Um, but for those that are worried about, um, you know. Uh, new technologies, you know, new concerns. We're living, we're on Zoom. I mean, we're living in a time of pandemic. I mean, you know, many, many new problems are going to be arising. Um, for those that um, cheer the state of affairs where um, Congress will be left not able to delegate to the administrative agencies, I think they have to be um, able to also live with the consequences of that and to ask themselves, what are the true benefits and costs of um, some of these doctrines? And to ask, you know, finally, you know, whether the equilibrium we have, um, once you pull out part of that equilibrium, whether the new equilibrium that results is one that we wanna live with. So with that, um, those are just some thoughts. And um, I don't know if Aaron either wants to respond or if you wanna invite student comments, but I'll leave that up to the organizers. Yeah, thank you um, for, for both of your comments. These have been great. Uh, I think maybe it makes sense to open up to questions since we only have a couple minutes. Uh, and then maybe you know, Aaron can respond during questions. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand uh, using the little hand function. Yeah, L. Thanks, Hallie. Um, Professor Holly, thank you for your remarks. I'm wondering what your thoughts would be on um, in the event that um, the court decides to revisit the non-delegation doctrine and um, decides to return to the older understanding, what kind of effect would that have on the agency structure? Um, do you see it disrupting the agencies or would there be some kind of compromise to accommodate the new circumstances? That's a good question. As Professor No's comments suggested, I think it would place uh, a lot of the burden back on Congress. Um, and uh, you know, we can debate whether they have the institutional competence uh, to, uh, to do that, um, to in fact uh, make the law that we all need. Um, but I think you would see a restructuring um, a bit in the agencies. I think uh, they would become uh, slightly less important. Um, there may be, um, as uh, Professor No uh, suggested, um, that there would certainly be room uh, for the courts to to, uh, sort of use ordinary statutory interpretation tools uh, to find an intelligible principle. Uh, but I think if you look at Justice Gorsuch's opinion there, um, he's not going to be satisfied uh, with public interest. Um, maybe some of the other justices will be, um, but he's going to require more of Congress. Um, and in my view, at least, that, that's a good, uh, a good place to start because that's where the Constitution uh, seems to place uh, the legislative authority. Um, so it would, it would theoretically uh, make agencies less important. Uh, which, uh, you know, you've got all the arguments about them being unelected and unaccountable. Um, in my view, uh, that would be a good thing. Yeah, uh, Ken. Thank you so much, professors. Uh, are there some issues within law that are more appropriate for delegation within our constitutional structure? For example, like if we're, if we're talking about maybe making roads, you would delegate to the engineers, like the architectural um, you know, a functions of those. Uh, is there some kind of dividing line as to which which topics are we don't delegate versus topics that we're more willing to delegate and would be allowed within our constitution? Well, I, I think maybe not not road building to that extent. Um, a lot of uh, the sort of defense of the administration state administrative state does rely on the ability to apply experts. Uh, or to hire experts and to rely on their expertise. You can have scientists who work at uh, agencies, whereas you might not have a scientist in you know, nuclear physicist, nuclear physics uh, who's in Congress. So that's one of the arguments in favor uh, of them having the sort of discretion uh, over policy. Um, I think as Professor No mentioned, there may be areas of the law such as foreign, af 
affairs uh, in which the executive is clearly in charge. Uh, so in those areas, I, I would argue you may get some more deference uh, to administrative agencies uh, that report uh, to the executive. Um, but, but I wouldn't rely too much on the expertise argument. Yeah, I mean, that's so I so um, Professor Holly has already mentioned um, what, what immediately came to my mind, which is Ian Gorsuch's observation about um, foreign affairs. And I think national security is, you know, right, right in there in that um, domain as well. Um, and I just want to kind of emphasize just one other theme in, in response to um, some of the other questions, which is, you know, it's I, I wouldn't frame this as, you know, does Congress make policy or the, these unelected bureaucrats, administrative agencies, because, of course, you know, there's the president. I mean, I think we have to think about this in the era of presidential administration. And, um, you know, I just observe that, you know, there's just like a tension, for, I think, in some of these arguments um, for, on the one hand, those that want to return um, to Congress, maybe with the knowledge that Congress probably won't be able to rise to the challenge in these modern times and um, legislate with more specificity. Um, and at the same time, you know, these are there are those that are full throated Article two, you know, take care that the laws are faithfully executed and want a really robust role for the president and celebrate all the ways in which the president is a democratically accountable and elected. And so I, I just, you know, I guess I just you would just remark and say, I think there really has to be kind of a, a squaring of that of that tension a little bit that, you know, these that, you know, what is the response to those that celebrate the president's role in the administrative state um, as another um, center of democratic accountability? Um, I think that, you know, there, these are, I think particular cases are going to highlight some of these tensions. And I think and this is Justice Scalia as an example of this. You know, I think Justice Scalia is a, is a really supporter of Chevron. And, you know, he's not usually someone that we would find siding with the liberal side of the court. And, you know, he, he very much, you know, good executive branch lawyer. I think he thought that um, the president could fill in a lot of these spaces and was um, the right actor to, to make a lot of the policy. Okay, um, I know that you have to go at one. So maybe this is a good point to tie it off so you get a, a couple Let's, minutes. We can do one more if, there, if there's another question. Okay, yeah. do we have one more question? Yeah, we'll give it to Ed. I'd just like to thank both of our speakers. Uh, I haven't taken admin law yet, and I was wondering, um, both of you mentioned uh, the possibility, or I, I think uh, Justice Gorsuch wrote about it, um, the possibility that uh, Congress perhaps give the regulatory agencies a fact-finding role. What would that look like uh, in a statute? Would it just be like a conditional, if you find this, then do this? How, how would that work? That's a really good question. And, and he didn't flesh that out. I, I think that your intuition is right, at least from reading that opinion. I'd be curious as to what Professor No thinks. But it, from reading that opinion, it seems to indicate that he would ask um, Congress to sort of specify the things uh, that the agency needs to find. So if we're talking about SORNA, uh, for example, you know, if, uh, you know, if the sex offender um, had committed such and such a crime, um, then, uh, then the statute might apply to them. So I, I do think that he's envisioning more of an investigative uh, sort of role uh, for the agency rather than setting the standards. Um, but, but yes, that's, that's a good question. Um, and how, you know, how tight those standards have to be, um, if they need to, to really be spelled out, or if there's some leeway in agencies and sort of crafting them um, in their fact finding um, isn't really spelled out. But, but he seems to contemplate uh, the policy making decisions uh, lying with uh, Congress uh, and the agency simply finding facts that Congress lays out. I see that we're out of time. I mean, I'm tempted to respond, but I don't want to Thank no, no, go, go ahead. I, so, that's not fair not to give you a chance. And then I'll, yeah. Oh, well, no, I mean, no, I mean, there's not much to add to. I mean, like, so Gorsuch, you know, cites a bunch of precedents where, you know, they, the statutes exactly are of the kind that you said, Ed, you know, they, you know, for example, one is, you know, the pre if, if the agencies find that, you know, there was a, a, a non-equal trading relationship, right, um, then, then the, then the decision would go forward. So, it, as a whole, I think Gorsuch just wants to drain discretion from the agencies such that it's just if you find the fact, then uh, the result is preordained by the statute. Yeah. Okay, well, um, with that, we'd like to thank you both again for coming. Uh, it's, it's been great to hear you talk. We're glad that we 
we eventually we initially rescheduled this event from from last spring with COVID. So we're really glad that you were able to still come and join us today. And thank you, Professor No, for your commentary. Thanks, guys. Take administrative law. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Bye.